Hi, everybody. My name is Rob Stoner, and I played bass on American Pie, many Bob Dylan albums, and a lot of other things that you probably heard. In fact, behind me, you can see, here's several of my Golden Platinum albums for playing on hit records. I want to thank John Liebman for his wonderful job with Four Bass Flares Only, and for having me on his show. Watch this guy. He really knows where the bodies are buried. Thank you very much, John. Thank Rock you. on, everybody. Oh! Hi, everyone. I'm John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Our very special guest this week is Rob Stoner. How you doing, Rob? All right, John. It's great to be back with you. It's been quite a while. 2009 is that when we did it last? 2009 was when we did the first interview. You were the you were one of the first interviews I ever did on ForBaseBlayersOnly.com. Wow. I've got over 800 now. Whoa, and dude! You've been busy. You are one of them. Well, now you're one and a half of them. <laughs> great. Well, way back in 2009, we talked a fair bit about your work with bob dylan and we uh -huh. talked about your songwriting contract with lieber and stoller which was a yeah, very right. big deal yeah. and we talked about how you sang and played that killer bass line that i've always loved so much on american pie well thank you yeah what's keeping you busy these days <laughs> well since the pandemic dude uh, you know i i turned down all the work that comes my way that involves leaving the house which means that the only work that I do is Zoom sessions. I do uh, Zoom teaching sessions. I, I have students all over the world who I do Zoom sessions with every week. And uh, I do studio work, but I just go to this one, either I do it here or I do it at this one specific studio near my house so I don't have to interact with people. I just like have totally, Totally chilled out with all that stuff. Also, I had a heart operation a couple of years ago, uh, open heart surgery. So I'm like really so careful about my health. And I, I work out like crazy. I live next to a state forest, state forest, so I can go hiking every day. And I work out with weights. So I'm basically just staying home, keeping fit, and making scads of videos. I make videos every day of tunes that I like with me singing and playing either uh, guitar or bass or piano or whatever I can, or ukulele, whatever I can get. And I uh, put those up on YouTube and Facebook, and they seem to be getting a great reaction. I've been doing it for ever since the beginning of the pandemic, and now i got hundreds of them. Well, yeah. that's a, a bunch of stuff that you mentioned. What do you feel like talking about, or what do you feel like talking about first? Um. Well, about uh, giving Zoom lessons, I think is is a groove, man. I, I, most of my most of my students are guitar students, so I got guitar students all over the world now. And Zoom, it, I just I never would have thought, man. But it was, you know, it, it was just because it, it was my only choice, really, because I didn't want people coming in and out of my house anymore with the with the COVID shit going around. Do you consider yourself more of a guitar player or a bass player? Guitar player guitar player. And, and always did i played guitar long before i played bass i only took up the bass to make extra money i, I saw that ad that uh that ad that said uh bass players i mean guitar players increase your income buy a bass and uh you know that was the earliest uh fender bass campaign I was going to ask their you, pitch. about about what year would that have been? That would uh, well, not that this isn't the year I saw it, but this year that that campaign existed was 1952, when they first marketed the precision bass. Their marketing strategy was let's get guitar players to they can double, increase their income, and all they got to do is invest in our product. And it worked. A, a ton of guitar players came over to to, uh, to becoming bass players. And I'm one of those guys. I mean, I did it 10 years after this 1952, but nonetheless, that's why I did it. So I was I was doing great playing playing uh, all kinds of gigs as a guitar player. And I saw that uh, bass players were really in demand, and guitar players were a dime a dozen. So I said, Hey, man, I'm going to get me a bass. And do this because you know on the guitar you do so much i mean the instruments are so close i tell all my guitar students learn the bass and i tell all my bass students learn the guitar 
<laughs> because they're so related. It expands your musicianship, and uh, you get a much understand, a much greater understanding of how songs work if you learn songs both ways. Learn from the ground up, and then learn all the other stuff. The 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 baseline on American Pie. I mentioned well, thank before, you. before we went live. I've always loved that because it's it's not a complicated tune, but you put your own. There's that. Do 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 do. That oh yeah, you like that, that? My little funk lick. Yeah. Well, how did you? It, it's like you played the line. You you did what was asked of you, what was expected of you, yeah. but you signed it. You put your own Thanks. self into it. How did you come up with that line? Well, I was trying to channel James Jamerson, as 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 I often do on a tune with that kind of feel, and um, that boom 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 is a total Jamerson type lick. Or I don't know. You could put it off the Chuck Rainey. There's a lot of cats who who use that kind of lick. And it was perfect. And of course, it occurs in the hall where there's no singing going on because you never play anything like that. You never play anything except the roots of the chords, really, when the singer's going or you'll get fired. Right. So um, the deal is that the, the tune was done in one afternoon and uh, the piano player, Paul Griffin, he was like the hero of the session because McLean came in, like most singer-songwriters, you know, he's strumming a bunch of G chords and crap, and, you know, that, and there's nothing going on, man. And, you know, it's up to the cats on the date to make it sound like something. So we had this great drummer who I'd never worked with before, Roy Markowitz, and he, uh, he was in um, Janis Joplin's Road Band, a uh, great drummer. He also played with Al Cooper, Roy Markowitz, great cat. So um, we had him and uh, Paul Griffin... And David Spinoza, who's a Broadway guitar player, yeah, of now jazz guy of, of repute, and so that was that was the backup. And uh, McLean, he starts strumming his stuff, you know, and we're just we just fall in behind him, and you know, I'm just like playing the roots, and there were no charts, you know, it was Excuse just. Excuse like, me, did did you know? Did you all those guys know each other, or did you? No, we'd them? never met, man. Okay. We'd, none of us had ever met. That's so, even better. All right, go on. Except I had met McLean because I'd played on his previous records. I didn't know. He, he didn't have too many. He had uh, Vincent yeah, and American had, Pie. Yeah, and, and no, no. The, he had an album before American Pie album. The, the, uh, Vincent was on American Pie. Okay. And, and But uh, before America, the American Pie album, he had another album on a, on a smaller label. I saw. I used to see McLean's uh, concerts advertised all over town, like at the music store and stuff. He did these solo folk concerts, but I never went to one. I never met the cat because, like, I was a rocker and he was a folky, and you know, never the twain met back then. It was, you know, we just were, moved in totally different circles. So, uh, so I, I finally met him when I was called to play on this date for him, when I was already a professional, and that was for his first album, Tapestry. There's now, another Tapest album by that name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, McLean's was out first. Imagine his dismay when the Carol King record came out with the same name. But like McLean's kind of vanished without a trace because it was a tiny record label and there was no uh, there was no promotion. But at the same time, the fact that this major hit was had the same name at the same time was <laughs> also sort of torpedoed. It. However, his songwriting gained him notoriety from that album. There was an, a song on that album called And I Love You So, which was subsequently recorded by Elvis Presley, Perry Como, Andy Williams, all those, what they used to call M-O-R, Middle of the Road Cats. Yeah. yeah. They all recorded this song. And I, it goes like, And I love you so People ask me how I've lived until now I tell them I don't know a really cheesy tune that was beautiful. and so all these cheesy singers sang it and uh so that really got him on the map as a songwriter singer songwriter and that's how he got the 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 gig with uh, american pie which was for a bigger label so we knew he knew that this album american pie was sort of do or die at i mean at that moment for his career because he'd already yeah. failed with this earlier album do <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Did you play on the whole album or just a, a few cuts? On, on the that? Tapestry? No, on uh, American Pie. American, yeah, every cut, bro. Yeah, Vincent, all that stuff, man. I remember. It was, what, it was about 1972? Something. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Remember, hey, check this out, man. The, the, the album was nominated for four Grammys and didn't win a single one. 
I went to the Grammy Awards with him. To we were going to play on stage, you know, and um, so so it, it, he was nom- He was beat out by people like "Alone Again" naturally by Gilbert O'Sullivan. Yeah. "I Am Woman" by Helen Reddy. Yeah. I mean the the concert from Bangladesh. Okay, that's okay. I don't mind being beat out for that. But like by <laughs> the cheesiest tunes, beat him out. For Record of the Year, New Artist of the Year, Song of the Year, all these things he was nominated for, <laughs> American Pie didn't win a single one. And all the stuff that won is now forgotten. Oh, I don't know. I still hear that uh, Gilbert O'Sullivan song. <laughs> and, uh, there Poor was guy. a uh, my wife sorry and I were watching a year or two ago a, a, a right. show about Helen Reddy. It wasn't uh-huh. with her. It was an actress yeah, right. portraying uh-huh. her. Hey, American Pie, I got to ask you, what is that song about? Ah, oh, right. Uh, well, it's about uh, eight and a half minutes. <laughs> oh! No, I'll tell you what it was about. Yeah, it's three hours and 20 minutes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically inspired by the plane crash in 1959 right. that killed Buddy Holly and Richie Valens and the Big Bopper. Right. <laughs> and the day the music the, died. That, yeah, right. That much I got. Yeah, right. right. And he's talking about he's a paper boy and, you know, he's doing bad news on the doorstep. February was February. February made me shiver. Yeah. And then he uses all of these um, these metaphorical allusions to uh, various people in popular culture to uh, to try and drive the, the thing home. Like, for instance, the birds right, are, are in there. The quartet is the Beatles. Um, let's see, uh, who else does he mention? A girl who sang the blues, who sang the blues is, uh, Janis Joplin, um, the Rolling Stones, Jack Flash, uh, no angel born in hell could break that Satan spell that was like, you know, her satanic majesty's a whole, you know, Rolling Stones thing where they were trying to set themselves off as, you know, uh, satanic messianic guys. And, uh, let's see, what else? Um... Oh, the gesture, duh, Bob Dylan. Why? Why is he referred to as a gesture? He refers to himself as the gesture all the time. He's got a song called "The Joker Man." When people asked him, uh, you know, they've asked him in uh, in interviews. You know, he they, he's always trying to play down his uh, his role as the. Uh, the oracle for the whole, you know, peace left wing, um, you know, social consciousness thingy. And he says, oh, I'm just a song and dance man. That's a famous quote of his. And uh, I'm just joking. He's just, you know, always putting people on. So that's why he's called the jester. And when he- I, as I watched him on the stage, my hands were clenched in fists of rage. He's what talking is- about the Rolling Stones. Why? Uh, he he th- thought that they had forsaken rock and roll by inst- and turning their back on the Bible and God and stuff by embracing the Satanism stuff. It was okay. it was just a bunch of crybaby crap, man. You know, incarnation was, and a pickup truck was that just who he was? Or no, what? dude. There was this f- hit song in the fifties called "A White Sport Coat and a Pink Carnation." I'm all dressed up for the dance. It was a big hit record by Marty Robbins, I believe. Wow. So there's there's references galore in this. Did you write the Book of Love? Okay. Well, I wonder, wonder, who wrote the Book of Love? Okay. This is so fun, Rob. <laughs> so the whole thing is laden with these clues about early rock and roll that he thought it would be interesting for the audience to have a game deciphering. And to this day, they have fun with it, and they read all this deep stuff into it. I read about his widowed bride. All right, Buddy Holly, his wife, his, uh, his widow. So, you know, he's talking about America's gradual descent from the, from the halcyon days of the, of the 50s with pink carnations and, you know, and the Bible tells me so and Roy Rogers and, and everything. There are a like, lot of verses. Yeah, just, yeah, there's like five or six of them, I think. Yeah. Oh, it's a funny thing about that, bro. I'll tell you a funny story about that. So, so the the tune is rocking along, and you listen to the track, and it's just swinging and swinging and swinging. And um, of course, we had all written out, you know, numbers charts, Nashville style, just so we, you know, ha- be able to, you know, sketch the tune like anything that you're playing cold. And um, the song had already gone on for about seven minutes. And if you listen to the track before 
the last verse begins, you'll hear the, the musicians start to slow down imperceptibly. Bum, 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 bum. And then they pick back up. Why? We thought it was the end of the song when it goes into the, into the rubato thing. Yeah. I met a girl who sang. Because the thing starts rubato and ends rubato. And so, you know, the, the way that we got out of it was we're, we're playing these eighth notes, bum, 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 and then we slow them down. And when you listen on the, what is the last verse, you'll hear a bum, 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 plink. I heard a big sang the blues. And, you know, that's, well, that's how it ends. That sounds like it's on purpose. That always is leading into the rubato section. So why wouldn't you do a Because we did the... it. We thought it was a verse early. Oh, oh, oh I I'm see. talking about everybody, the verse, the verse before everybody make that same mistake because we're, you know, we're in a groove. We're in a room together. It's when people play together, they hear each other. And also we all anticipated the same thing. This song's going on forever already. So we're thinking, oh man, this has got to be the rubato part, man. But then we see McLean he's getting ready to sing the next verse. So we picked it right back up again. So in those days, everything was recorded straight to tape live. Oh, live. yeah, man. There's no, no ODs on this. No, nah, the only thing they overdubbed was a McLean came in to get his vocal better, and they got a professional guitar player to play his rhythm part. Okay, so, but there, there's a doubling. I always thought it was his voice doubled at the end. Is that No, right? that's – no, man. That's no, his – that's there's there's two vo two distinct voices, and I'm not talking about the end. At the end, there's a whole crowd of people singing. Okay, it sounds like a, a drunken you know bar full of people or something or a party. But on all the previous verses, except for the first one where he slowly cranks it up, bye okay. bye, the ones that are at tempo, every one of those has a high harmony. Say it, say it. Who is it? Yeah, exactly. And so I'm doing an Everly Brothers type thing, a Phil Everly part on top of his part. And so I'm singing thirds above him. Bye, it was just bye, Miss American Pie. I drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. Them good old boys are drinking whiskey and rye, singing this will be the day that I die. And so what, I'm a third above that, him. What does that mean, drove my Chevy? to? Well, what does bye-bye Miss American Pie mean? Is that uh, just a, I think he, what he's saying is, is it's basically a sort of a metaphoric loss of innocence he's addressing. Say yeah, that, and okay. so, you know, bye-bye to, you know, wholesomeness and apple pie and Miss America and, you know, and uh, and to the, Drove my Chevy what? to the levee. Whoa, okay, where did that okay, go? okay, Chevy. By the way, Mc McLean never owned a Chevy, man. He was like a Volvo type you know a, a sob he drove a fucking sob that's what in, he drove man in the early 70s yeah man 60s? okay yeah he did he never he never had an american car that i knew of so uh How so ironic. anyway he, so <laughs> what he's saying is he's making himself out to be this all-american guy drives a chevy yeah american car and um he didn't drive a chevy so he's he's picking the most american sounding brand he can for his lyric the levy rhymes is, with Chevy. Is, it rhymes with Chevy, and also <laughs> it's sort of a signifier of early rock and roll because of, say, um, Hank Williams songs. Goodbye, Joe, we gotta go, me, oh, my, oh. You know, songs about levies and bios and, you know, that kind of southern uh, delta type stuff. Levies are things that you are, are, are uh, barriers that you only find in the Mississippi Delta or in, in or in any river delta, I should say. Is that what Led Zeppelin had in mind when they did when the levee breaks? Yeah, man, totally. The Mississippi yeah. Delta. Yeah, totally. And you listen to the song, man. It's a total blues delta type thing when the levee breaks. I thought a levee that was, was a lot. Was, I, I, was a barrier anywhere to to hold back water from over exactly it's it's a earthen berm that is constructed above the uh, uh, to on the on a river bank to keep the river from going over the into the farmland when the right. when the river rises that's all that's all levy is that i knew but i didn't know it was inherent to a particular region yeah the, well it's just so happens that most of the songs about levies happen to be mississippi delta blues tunes that's what that's where they come from. So he's harking back to that uh, sort of Americana form of folk music, which often mentions levies, as Led Zeppelin, who were fond of recycling American lore, sure, in, in their songs. Um, uh, so so he's 
talking about driving his Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. Oh, how ironic. Okay, what he's saying is, uh, the you know, it's sort of like, I've, I went to the well, but there was nothing there. Uh, also, coincidentally, the levee was the name of a bar in New Rochelle where he used, where he used to play from time to time. So you could read it several different ways. I went down to the sacred store. The sacred store was the place where he used to buy his, his 45s, his records. And uh, I know it because I used to go to the same place. It was the only place in town where you could buy, 40, buy singles. So oh, whenever right. a new Buddy Holly record or whatever would come out. Oh, by the way, speaking of Buddy Holly, since the thing is a tribute to Buddy Holly, did you know that the melody to this tune is taken verbatim from a Buddy Holly record? It's it's a ver it's a, not a very well known Buddy Holly song, but this is a fact, and he put this in as yet another coded message for people who are trying to decipher this stuff. Uh, the song is called. Let me find a guitar. Sorry, okay. It's it's a Buddy Holly song called "I'm Gonna Love You Too." Let's see. How's it go? It goes. Let's see. Uh, you can find this on. Uh, Ask your smart speaker to play it. It goes like this. Was that identical? I miss American it, th It's the same chords, man, and the same melody. Then some words happen. I don't care what you told me. I'm going to say you want me. Well, I'm going to say you love me. Well, I'm going to love you, too. There you go. That's <laughs> exactly the same okay. melody. One, one more American Pie question. Yeah. Singing, this will be the day that I die. Is that just uh, the culminating fate crash, bro? It, it, well, it's no, it's multi-layered. Actually, I think it's a, because he's, he's using the, uh, the fact that the, the overriding original metaphor is about that this plane crash was the signifier for the end of the original uh, era of rock and roll when it was still pure, and after that it all turned to crap. And that's why he's denigrating Dylan, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Birds. Everybody is, men is mentioned sort of pejoratively. When, when you... you remember the, the movie American Graffiti? Yeah, the sure. Cruising yeah. around, and he says, uh, he turns off the radio. He says, Rock and roll's been going downhill ever since. Same dealio, down. man. All the old school people thought that. They thought that the, the Buddy Holly plane crash was the delineating, demarcating historical line where things changed. Remember, Elvis had just gone in the army. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, who was perhaps the wildest and greatest of all the early rock and rollers, was blacklisted because of uh, his marriage to his uh, teenage cousin. Yeah, and so all of all of the music was become it was becoming kind of teeny bop music at that point. Now he doesn't mention any of the teeny bop guys who who uh, sort of uh, took the mantle from the original rockers. Gene Vincent, he was like a, a washed up drunk. All the original great guys, man, they were all history. And so it's just like the, the character you mentioned in American Graffiti. They're all looking at, at modern music and saying, wow, this is crap now. And so, of course, you know, that's how old codgers are, man. They're, oh, the stuff was better in the old days. Oh, the good old days. Yeah, man. Well, you know, if you don't want to get with the new program, it's your loss. You keep listening. I don't to want to go stuff. down another rabbit hole, but the, the, the cool. halftime show at the Super Bowl got me so upset. And I, well, I that's, just... yeah. I, <laughs> I tried to say, I tried to. Right. I try to ignore that. It, it's, it seems to me that uh, a lot of the modern music is, is really designed more for poets than for singers. Okay, because, yeah. Because what it is, is people got to have the beat. Okay, so we still got the beat in modern pop music. However, now singing vocal ability is no longer required. All you have to be able to do is to be a, a, someone who can declamate uh, effectively, preach, if you will, their message to a crowd over a beat. You and, hit it you know, right on the head. That is yeah, exactly. Maybe, the, maybe there's a couple of musicians perfunctorily, you know, standing around there because it's because they got a big budget and they can afford them. But basically, it's about the dude with the turntable, you know, d doing it. So musicians got automated out of pop music. 
I think when the drum machines came in, that was the beginning of it. By the time the, the, you had guys with hit records backed up by a dude with a turntable, forget it. It was all over, man. Okay. And it's been that way ever since. And um, so, therefore, yeah. apparently the, pub, the public no longer values mel melodies sung with technical skill. They just, they just want to hear... Uh, I mean, even the stuff that is melodic, oh, my God, it's like... I'm, I know this because I got young students, and they say, "Oh, will you teach me this song by this time?" And I listen to the song to teach them. That. And the guys and the the guys who are supposedly singing can't sing. Yeah. I mean, every so often you, you see, I sound like an old guy now too. Well, saying that's exactly. You know, I'm, I'm trying not to sound like you know when the Beatles came out and all the older generation. Oh, that rock and roll. It's like, you know, that's I'm what I thought. I thought. But even my grandkids, man, they're not. They, you know, they're into it too. I mean, that's what kids are into. Mazel tov. Go. God bless you. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I'm glad you got something to keep you busy. But like the stuff that we had is better, man. I mean, you listen to how hip the Motown records were. Hey, you know when the Beatles came out, we. Th thought the the original rockers i'm from the pre-beatles generation i had a band before the before anybody years before the beatles and when they came out we thought they're a bunch of interlopers man we thought wow what is this crap man it's a pale imitation of the stuff that that uh, that we grew up with that we're digging and that's sort of what mclean is tapping into in this he's being a crotchety old complaining dude saying that uh, shit was better back then, and everything since then has just turned to crap. You said a lot of your students are young. Uh, well, not a lot of them. About but, well, that's what I want to ask yeah, you. Right. Approximately, yeah. how old is your average student? My average student is a boomer. Okay. Is an old boomer who's yeah. retired. Yeah. Uh, has uh, has the wherewithal to afford my uh, my lessons. And um, and has has always wanted to have a hobby. Maybe, probably, or maybe played guitar in college or high school and let it go for like fifty years. And now they want to get back into it. That is exactly so, who I attract for, for on the bass side. I've got th there. You go, man. All over yeah, well, the world. And they've always wanted to do it. Maybe they dabbled yeah. in it. Now they have some time. They love That's the, the market. Yeah. stuff from the 60s and 70s. There I got a go, new man. soul course. I, I haven't announced it yet. I'm, I'm going to launch yeah, right. it in a couple oh, of soul base. They're inspired dude. by yeah. all the, you know, the James Brown and dude. Sly and, you know, yeah. all the. Oh, the, dude. The, okay. Well, the reason I asked know. about the age of your students, and I'm so glad that your answer was what it was. Uh, what advice do you have? I know you, you teach some bass, but it sounds like you teach mostly guitar. Students. Mostly guitar, yeah. Okay, but but me put on your bass hat for a minute. What sure. advice do you have for somebody in that cadre of people that wants to learn to play bass? They're not trying to set the world on fire. They're not career bound. They just want like you know hobby. They want to play with their friends, whatever. So, what advice do you have for somebody who wants to learn bass in that context? Uh, what you mean, a guitar player who wants to no, learn no, bass? No, uh, somebody oh. who wants to learn bass who's 50s 60s in their 70s you know that that's who's coming to forbassplayersonly.com you got to have a teacher man you can't do it on your own you need guidance you need a program you need someone who can listen to you and see what you're doing and point you in the right direction point out the the dead ends you might be going down and wasting your time with devise i noticed that every student i have has requires a different program I mean, it's I end it, That's why I charge so much, man, because I have to end it, tailor make my each student accord each student's program according to what their abilities and deficiencies are, and I just fill in the holes in whatever their musical trip is to try and make them more complete musicians. So you got to have a guide. You got to have an experienced instructor. That's my answer to your question. Do most of them have some idea what they want to learn or, you know, is I want to learn this song or I want to learn this style? Oh, yeah. or, if you learn all the songs in the fake book, or at least a bunch of them, you get to see a pattern of like how, you know, this chord progression, oh, and that chord progression, how this kind of bridge usually fits this kind of A section. And you, you learn the basic framework of how songs are constructed. And so I would learn, learning song construction is more important than actually playing. 
or, or learning, learning how to play within the context of song construction will teach you more about the principles of music. You'll see the logic of it fall into place that, that way. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you need a, a, a guide. You need an experienced guide to show you where it's at. You're speaking my language. Thank you, I'm man. Right. All right. My, my trademark sign-off question is, what would you be if you weren't a bass player? But it, you know, you're you're a guitar Ooh. player. It's got got to be something outside of music. So, what would that be for you, Rob? Wow, you know, I never even considered that. I am such a a lifer musician. I've been I've been in bands since I was like fourteen. It's all I've ever done. I can't even conceive of that. It's a nice question, but I got no answer for it. Okay, because I never had a plan B, bro. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, out of eight hundred and 800 plus interviews i've done with bass players uh, uh -huh. you're the first one that's ever said mazel tov in the uh, oh <laughs> wow it's about time man <laughs> yes it is now i can retire <laughs> <laughs> well i'm so glad we got to catch up let's not wait another well let's say 13 years or something until we do it again wow dude crazy I would love to uh it, it, this is your bar mitzvah interview 13 years that's right 13 years there you go man <laughs> like i said i played many a bar mitzvah when i was a teenager man oh yeah well <laughs> i i hope we get a chance to meet in person rob i really uh, enjoy talking to you likewise where are you based out of bro uh michigan michigan okay great detroit you mentioned james jamerson well, was, you know, yeah there you go yeah just man. up the road from where i am i hear you man what a yeah. fabulous scene you guys had a jazz scene in the yeah, in the 50s yeah. that gave rise to that great bunch of players that made all those records absolutely my dad was a rock and roll dj in the 50s and 60s oh really yeah so wow. he used to take that was six years old. well in, in cleveland first oh my you know, god another good like, rock and roll city Six years old is taking us mm -hmm. to see the Dave Clark Five and Whoa, the, dude. the Love How and fabulous. Spoonful, the Association. I, I oh. saw the Beatles. I saw the Beatles in 1966. Dude, that's that's great. I will never fabulous. forget. I was a small boy, but you know mm -hmm. what? I knew where I was. I knew who they were. Yeah. I knew the music. Yeah. I knew the, I remember sitting on the swings with my sister. When I was like three, four years old in the uh -huh. backyard going, she loves you. Yeah. 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 Wow. I'm <laughs> so sure. Yeah. They made an impression. <laughs> yeah, they did. You're you're bringing back a lot of great memories. That's that's why I mentioned that. So nice. I, I, you sound like a DJ, bro. Uh, I, you got I that did, kind of. You I got that it, voice. I did it for a while, but uh, uh, and then my my dad had a school actually, a very well known school. Oh, yeah. in, in yeah. the Michigan area yeah. for uh, radio and TV broadcasting, and yeah. I, I ran that for several mm -hmm. years. But yeah. I I'm not trying to sound like yes, yes. We're not trying. No, it sounds natural, man. You got that kind of cadence, that natural cadence, without trying to. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. All well, right, listen, John. Rob. Thanks again. Appreciate everything. And uh, let's, let's, uh, I hope we run into each other soon and often. Okay, bro. Great talking with you. Thanks Thank for interviewing me. Thank you so much. Me. Our special guest, Rob Stoner. I am John Liebman. You're watching for bassplayersonly.com. Let's play bass.